One thing I love about riding my bike is the rhythm of the pedals. It just triggers that state of bliss immediately. I want to keep riding and I just want to keep pedaling. If you ride a lot yourself, you know what I mean. And it's not just that bliss feeling. You're doing your body and your mind a huge service. And if you're over 50 and you cycle regularly, that puts you in the top 10 to 15% of the population in just about every measure of health. No caveats, no ifs, ands, or buts. You are fit. But we and you should want more than this. Because as a cyclist, particularly one like me that really enjoys that nice, rhythmic, easy cadence of a bike, we're really missing something. That rhythmic endurance level effort as we age could be leading to muscle weakness. And that muscle weakness can lead to some serious age-related decline. That is something we can do something about. So let's go over why this is important for your health. What's the difference between power and strength? How can we balance the two? And some differences between men and women on this topic. Now, first, let's talk about our enemies. You've probably heard of sarcopenia, and it's the loss of muscle mass as we age. But there's a more dangerous condition, and it's the loss of muscle strength, and that's called dynapenia. And it's disproportionate to the amount of muscle mass that we lose. In other words, as we lose muscle mass, we lose even more strength. And moreover, dynapenia happens quicker, and it happens sooner in our life. So we may not be losing muscle mass, but we may be losing muscle strength, and we really won't even notice it by looking at our bodies. Physiologists categorize our muscles as type one and type two. Type one are slow twitch muscles. They are smaller. They're the muscles that we use most when we're cycling because they're great at that repetitive motion and low effort, but long time effort, uh, endurance type activity. Type two muscles are the bigger muscles and they're used more for lifting very heavy weight and that really rapid, strong kind of violent motion. Honestly, we don't use type two muscles very often when we're cycling, but type two muscles are important. Sure, they'll make us stronger cyclists, but more importantly, they make us healthier because these larger muscles do more than just make us strong cyclists. In particular, they do what doctors call uh, act as a metabolic sink. So they help buffer things like glucose and triglycerides. So what that means is with more muscle mass, we can avoid things like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and all-cause mortality. And this is completely independent of our cardio fitness. So as cyclists, we just don't want to leave that benefit on the table. I am now physically going to demonstrate to you why as cyclists, we don't develop our type two muscles. This here is a smart trainer and I can set it to help me demonstrate why I'll do everything I can to avoid using type two muscles when I'm riding my bike. Also, this is my Road Less Traveled cycling kit and you can get it. I designed it with Joinier and designed it with a really comfortable chamois in the back so that it can stand up to long rides. I really demand high quality, so I put it through a lot of miles of testing before showing it on this channel. I also negotiated with Joyneer to give you 10% off on this and anything else that they have on their site, regardless of what sales they've got going on. So it stacks on top of any discount. Okay, when we ride our bikes, at high intensity for longer than just a few minutes. We balance the fatigue in our legs with the fatigue in our cardiovascular system. When we ride hard up a hill, or we're trying to ride fast, those are the two things that will stop us. I'm not talking about when we are just riding casually down the road, but when you're riding hard, uh, you're gonna wear one of those systems out. And studies have shown that 60 RPM is the optimal RPM to use your cardiovascular system. You'll use less energy at 60 RPM than you will for a higher or lower RPM. Now I'm riding at 90 RPM right now, and I have this smart trainer set at 150 watts. The way this trainer 
works, no matter how fast I'm pedaling, it's going to keep requiring that 150 watts. So it's like me going up a hill at a constant speed, can change my gears, change the cadence, but I still want, I'll still be going the same speed. So right now I'm pedaling at 90 RPM. Mathematically, I'm pushing on the pedals with a maximum force of about 40 pounds every time that pedal comes around. So I'm going into reduce my cadence and see what happens to my legs. I was at 90, I'm going down to 60. Okay, now my cadence is 60 and I can actually feel, it's not, doesn't feel as hard cardiovascular wise, but I can definitely feel it in my legs. I'm still producing 150 watts of power, not breathing as hard, but I'm putting a lot more force on the pedal, 50% more to be exact. Instead of 40 pounds, it's 60 pounds. And at this rate, I'm not gonna be able to keep going for a long time, maybe a half hour, I don't know. So as an experienced cyclist, and you probably had this experience, you've been trying to keep up with somebody or trying to get up a hill as quickly as possible. I know if I increase my cadence, I'm gonna have a much better uh, chance of making it or staying with the group. If I increase my cadence back up to 90 RPM, ah, uh, that feels much better. I'll make it. So there you have it. My cardiovascular system is much better at sustaining the hard effort than my muscular system. And voila, the bicycle has convinced me to stick with using my type one muscles. So as a cyclist, I'm really doing a great job of building my cardiovascular system because I'm putting it to its limits. And I'm doing that at the expense of my type two muscle fibers. I want to work my type two muscle fibers. I've got to come up with another way. Good fitness coaches will often evaluate their clients to determine if they have a force deficit or a velocity deficit, meaning a power deficit. Well, cyclists, as reasons we just demonstrated, often have a force deficit. There's a great way to address that. We'll talk about it. And we'll also talk about the difference between men and women when it comes to this. Now, having a force deficit was not something that was easy for me to accept, especially as a cyclist who thought they were a strong cyclist. But the reality is I did have a force deficit. And the research is clear. You really need to do some serious resistance training to make up for that. The challenge for me was when I started going to the gym, I started doing high rep lifting. But that's just not gonna cut it because I was working the same muscles that I was working, at least in my legs, when I was cycling. So that meant increasing the weight. But what do we do if we're older cyclists and we don't wanna hurt ourselves by increasing the weight? Now, of course, I do need to make a disclaimer. This is generic advice. I do not know you as an individual. If you're an older cyclist like I am, you probably know your body pretty well. So take my advice as generic advice to cyclists. So we need to recruit those type two muscle fibers. How do we do it? And how do we do it as older cyclists? Well, we need to use weights or something like it. If you're just starting, I would suggest these three steps. One, start with the high reps. Start with 15 to 20 reps. This will help get those tendons and those ligaments used to that movement and get you flexible and start building the strength. After time, maybe after you stop getting sore when you're doing that, then you can start to increase the weight. But my suggestion would be don't increase it too much. Increase it to the point where you can do eight to 10 reps. So after you're comfortable with the eight to 10 reps, as older cyclists, I wouldn't suggest going to heavier weight. What I would suggest, and the science backs this up, is using the eight to 10 reps, but on that push phase of the exercise, go fast. They even say, just try to push it through the ceiling. So as fast as you feel comfortable, the faster you do it, the better. It will recruit those same muscle fibers, those same type two muscle fibers that we're after. Now, this might make you question, aren't I getting that same kind of movement on the bike? perhaps when I'm sprinting or I'm doing something really quick up a hill. Well, you are. In fact, when I did that test earlier, I showed I was pushing 60 pounds on the pedals. When I do a five second really hard sprint interval, 
I can multiply that by four times and that really is getting me to that high of level. But there is something that you're missing that you will get and you can get with weights. And that gets me to the concept of concentric versus eccentric movement. Concentric movement is where in, when we're in that lifting phase or when we're cycling, it's when we're pushing on the pedals. Eccentric movement is in the return phase. And so if you're lifting weights, it's when you're bringing the weights back down. When you're cycling, you're just not getting it. In fact, for cyclists, they call this the missing half of your muscle work because we are just not resisting the pedals, we're only pushing on them. Have you ever gone on a long ride, maybe a four hour ride, and you feel really great that you've worked your muscles, and then you start to walk down a set of stairs, those times when we're using those eccentric muscles and your knees start to hurt? Well, this is why our, our muscles just aren't used to, and they haven't been accustomed to over the last four hours of resisting weight. And it's that eccentric movement that really helps us as we get older. It strengthens the tendons, it helps us with that repair, that build and repair part of the muscle, which we really need and what we're after here. But it's also what helps someone that's getting older from falling because it is what helps our body resist the movement down when we're going off of a step or we're, that there's some sudden movement that causes us to potentially fall. We need the eccentric muscles counterbalance that. Now this video would be really long if I tried to cover all the types of exercises and strength training we need to do as cyclists. I will cover that more in a future video, so sub subscribe if you want to follow along with that. But I want to discuss something that's different between men and women when it comes to resistance training. Dr. Stacy Sims is somebody who I really respect. I've followed her for some time and some, a lot of her advice. She's an exercise physiologist and, and a nutrition scientist, and she really focuses on women's health. But a lot of what she says applies to both men and, men and women, and it's really interesting to sort of see the differences. What she says for women and resistance training is that it is very important, perhaps more important for you as a woman. First, women who are peri or postmenopausal don't need to fear about bulking up when lifting weights. With the loss of estrogen, women are developing this anabolic resistance, making it much harder to build muscle mass. But women need muscle mass just as much as men do for all the reasons that we've discussed. But for women, there's one thing to pay attention to, and is after a very hard effort, protein consumption is vital. And this is what Dr. Stacy Sims says, because women have a much lower level of testosterone hormone the protein synthesis is much more difficult. And so protein needs a little bit more, the body needs to give it a little bit more kick in order to get those higher levels of protein to absorb. Uh, Dr. Stacy Sims recommends 40 grams. And importantly, she says that needs to happen within 30 to 60 minutes of that hard effort. Without that, the body will resist it. This is different than men. Doctors say that men have 10 to 20 times more time to take in protein after a hard effort. But men have their own things to consider. And one that I want to mention is uh, something that surprised me, and it's the time of day. So a lot of times I was doing my workouts in the evening, but as we age, men begin to lose their testosterone hormone, the level goes down. What well, turns out, testosterone levels in men are their highest in the morning, between seven and 10 in particular. So as we age, uh, if we do our exercise, particularly our strength work, which is that muscle building exercise in the morning from seven to 10, then the testosterone can help. That horm the hormones that help us build our muscles are the highest at that point. As time goes on throughout the day, particularly as we're older, we may not even have those hormones available to us to really build muscle. Now, again, this is different than women who don't have a lot of testosterone hormone. They have other hormones, it may actually make it worse for building muscle in the morning. So for women, it's better to wait later in the day, according to Dr. Sims. So let's summarize. Cardiovascular health is vital, and for cyclists, that is our superpower. But muscle health is just as important. And if you're a cyclist, you probably have a force deficit, which means you have power, but you can't match that in strength. That means we're missing the health benefits of those larger muscles. We can fix it, 
we just need to hit the weights. There are a lot of other things I wanna cover on this topic, so please follow along. Let me know in the comments what you think of this. If you've got any other ideas, I'd love to hear it. Share this with anybody you care about, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.